Katie, I know that we're like pre 11, you yep. want to wait right till 11 to like thank the sponsors or? No, I will, I will go ahead and thank the sponsors now. Thank you to our high level sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox Open Library Initiative and Mobius Libraries. Whew. We, we appreciate everybody. Thanks, Katie. All right. So uh, welcome, everybody, to the Ruth and Andrea Show, Branches on the Evergreen Tree, New Feature Highlights for 3.8 and 3.9. Um, I'm glad that we have a full hour to talk about this because there is a lot of great stuff to talk about. So first of all, in case you don't know us, um, this is us. Um, I am the project manager for software development at Equinox, and I work with libraries throughout Evergreen and other open source projects on contract software development and um, all kinds of other other feature and bug fix stuff to make the software better. And I have known Ruth for, gosh, so long now. Ruth and I go way back. I think it's been almost a decade. Not it's quite, been but probably right around a decade. Yeah. Yeah. It's been fun. It's been great. Do you great. want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, other than the so fact that I you've known each other? kind of think it's funny um, that we have our titles in here and um, then we try to explain what we do. And um, that could be sessions, but people's eyes would glaze over. So I'm the coordinator for both Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium here in Indiana. And then for the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, that uh, is a membership organization of Evergreen end user uh, consortia and libraries. We pool resources, money, and time to uh, prioritize and then prioritize development projects. And we contract with people like uh, Equinox, often Equinox. And then we test and are part of the release uh, cycle for that. So lots of fun things for me. I enjoy all of it. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I like, um, I definitely like this part of our jobs. Yes. All right, so um, here's what we're gonna talk about because I like roadmaps. Um, and this belies the sheer volume of content that we're getting ready to throw at you. <laughs> So towards the end of our slide deck, there is a slide with uh, links to like documentation and release notes and other things where you can learn more about the uh, crazy amount of features that we're getting ready to to toss at you in the next. And do you mind if I throw the slides directly into chat? Are you cool with that? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know if I set them to be externally publicly mm -hmm. shareable. But I can. But you can. All right. Yeah. Go for it. Cool. So... All right. Um, last year, we actually had some feedback that we were a little jargony, uh, which is fair because Ruth and I have both been involved in Evergreen for like ever. And sometimes we forget to define our terms. Um, so here's some, if you're newer to the community, here's some things you might hear us talk about um, and what they mean in relationship to, to new features and stuff like that. So, and if you have a question about a specific piece of terminology, just drop it in the chat and either one of us one of us will answer it, or one of the, you know, uh, how many of you are here? One of the 111 <laughs> other individuals <laughs> in here will probably be able to answer your jargon question. So if we use a term that you don't know, please, please ask, because we definitely want to, to share the love here. All right, first up is circulation features. Ruth, you want to do the first one? Yeah, so this is one of the things that uh, when it came down the pipe, I was particularly uh, excited about. We love the holes uh, pull list, but one of the issues has been that it's always tied to the workstation that you are registered at. And uh, that's fine if you're in a single branch uh, library system, but if you're in a multi-branch system and you need to be looking at th things in a different way. Um, now there is the option to actually scope your holds pull list um, now that there's an org unit selector in here. It's, it's kind of a small thing, but it really improves quality of life yep. for our end users, so. Yep, lets you check the hold shelf, um, see where it, what if something is maybe somewhere that you don't expect it, you can look at that. Mm -hmm. And this uh, is also- Go ahead. Okay, so one thing I will say about this 
is that one of the things that I was hoping that it did would scope to the system level and show everything there in case so you needed to look maybe it's in another location it doesn't do that yet um, okay. but it does uh, it scopes to the branch level yeah that's actually a tidbit that I don't think I, I knew precisely that it doesn't do inheritance it just um, yeah, grabs the, the like the specific focus of the of the drop down cool well, there is an element in um, Angular, and this is, by the way, you want to know what an Angular interface looks like? This is what it looks like. Um, this is one of the ones that has been converted. Um, there is a Angular widget that lets you select uh, ancestors and descendants from these drop downs. So maybe another a future iteration of this can include that. Yeah, that's my hope. All right. See, open source, responsive to your needs. Next up. Um, is the patron triggered events log. So this has been a feature that has existed in Evergreen forever, not maybe not forever, but like for a really, really long time. Yeah. Unfortunately, Zool. many of you was in Zool. Uh, many of you might not have actually ever been able to use this because there was some inefficiencies with the query and particularly, um, and you know, the Dojo interface was slow. And especially if you were a large data site, you might not have actually ever been able to um, to make use of this, but no. now you can, um, thanks to um, the both patron and item triggered event log um, has have now been rewritten and re-implemented in Angular. So if you're not sure what a triggered event is, it's basically for our purposes, this includes um, hold and overdue, pre-do notices, things like that sent via SMS or email. And I included on the slides um, directions to find this if you don't know uh, where to find it. So if a patron is, uh, in front of you and wants to know, you know, oh, well, did I get a notification for that? You can look this up. And if it was a system generated notification, um, you can say, oh yeah, you know, we sent you an SMS on, on this date at this time. And then you can do the same thing um, from an item focus. You can look at it and say what kinds of events were generated for this particular barcode. Um, and these new inf uh, interfaces, which were put into 3.8, currently open in a new browser tab because they live in Angular, JS interfaces right now, but eventually as um, their parent interfaces are rewritten, they will get folded, just folded directly in. And so I have some screenshots. So this is what, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say, so the interface right now where you would access them is written in Angular JS and it opens out into an Angular page or tab. Cor correct, correct. Um, and that's because that was the, Mm -hmm. simpler way to do that than try to embed. Um, so this is what the patron side of the log looks like. It's just showing you um, what was sent, when it was sent, um, what the item was, and some of the item information, where it was sent from. Um, and then, not surprisingly, the um, item specific looks quite a bit like that, but it is instead focused on a specific item. And in this case, it gives you some of the patron information um, but it also still gives you, you know, when the when the, the uh, event ran, what happened with it, and these all show as complete. But if there was some kind of error or something, it would show, you know, error. So that's also helpful. Again, if you're sitting there with a patron and you can say, oh yeah, this didn't send. Let's look into that. So, triggered events log. So. There's a comment uh, by Lindsay saying, for a wish list, adding the template output would be even more awesome. I'm assuming the template for yeah. The yeah. Yeah. The template output being um, like the text of the notice. Um, and yeah, there might be, there are a couple of additional wish list bugs around this interface um, already. So that, that might be one of them. And if not, it should be. All right. Okay. Um, patron messages. So this was one that uh, goes back to MassLink, which was the predecessor to Ruth's organization, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative. And this sort of crossed that transition between those two organizations. So this was an idea from MassLink to take the various uh, ways that we communicate with patrons about penalties <laughs> and alerts and the way that the system communicates with us about patron information and consolidate them into a single thing. And so now there is a single thing as of 3.8 that does that. Um, and on the next couple of slides, I'll show you some screenshots of that. Um, but it is um, uh, the notes and messages and things can be scoped as visible 
um, to specific org units, or, or I should say org unit levels. So you'll see it's it's like this branch, this system, full consortium. So if you only need to show an alert locally, you can absolutely do that. Um, so there are a few things if you're a long time user that you should be aware of. So this means that that alert message field that used to live in the patron edit is no longer present. You do that now through this notes interface. That also means that it is uh, removed from the offline patron registration screen because that loads that same patron registration interface. Um, the uh, Dojo patron message center is still extant in the patron interface. Um, that has not been updated yet, but as of, I think, literally last week, uh, my colleague Jason Etheridge has put a pull request on removing that old um, Dojo patron message center and doing a few little improvements to this consolidated message mm -hmm. center as well. So that is what the yet is linked to that bug. So. And there are um, a few changes to permissions, reports, and auditor tables that this brings about because this is a pretty big change um, in the back in the back end of things. So if you're a system administrator, make sure you read those upgrade notes and um, communicate accordingly. And so for context in this too, this was one of the first projects that I came in on, um, very green and understanding uh, very little about what I'd signed up to do. And that was in 2019. And so to see this in uh, a release in 3.8 is um, a really good thing for me. And also a shout out to all of the people who provided feedback on this over the years uh, to get it to this point. It's important to point all of that out. Yeah, this was very yeah. much a, a community effort in a lot of ways. Um, and it took a few iterations to get it like, you know, to the point where it was ready to be merged. This is, this is a good collaboration. And I've got some some pictures here. So that's what that notes interface looks like now. You access it from the patron editor. And again, in case there are some new people among us, I have to emphasize every single screenshot you're seeing is from a demo system. This is not a real patron. We would never put screenshots of real patron information up in a presentation. But if you didn't know that, I just want to make sure I'm clear that this is all test system information made up made up patrons. So this shows you where you would um, see all of your notes, alerts, and messages. You can see your archive notes on the bottom. Um, my very clever, this is a note and this is an alert note text. And then um, from when you click create note or if you double click on a note to edit it, this is the modal you see. And so if you're creating a note, you know, you have options to make it patron visible or not. You um, have an option to do that depth selector. And that's what says this branch system, full consortium. Uh, the only thing you're required to enter is the title, um, which is why that's highlighted in yellow. And then you can see on the right um, is creating a block, which is the same exact thing, except it changes the penalty type from no, no blocks to alerting block. So that's what will pop up if you try to circulate or hold or something like that. So it's all one interface now to do this, one modal with different options in it, and hopefully that streamlines that process. Taryn makes a good point that it took quite a bit of staff education to get them used to it. And this is one of those kind of sea changes um, that when you are upgrading to one of these versions, it really does require some explicit training for your staff to get them yeah used to this brand new um, interface that pulls everything together and allows them to do things that they may not have necessarily even thought about doing, even though they could do them before because they were all in these different places. Now they have more options all in here. And so making sure to communicate that to our end users is really important. Yeah, absolutely. This is the this is one of those things that was definitely a big change. And if you're upgrading to 3.8, you know, it's one of the things you want to make sure you look at before you upgrade. If you have access to a test system, make sure you play around with it, see what it does. Um, and if possible, um, look at it in a test system with your own data so you can see how it works like in a any more of a real world setting for you. Yes. So yeah, good, good advice. Will alerts still show um, when you open the patron's account in red, is that yes, as, lo as yeah. long as it's still configured. Yes. Yeah, you get if it's an alert, you get the stop sign thing still. 
and it'll yep. show that. Okay. Um, so this one, I'm sorry, I'm doing all the talking, Ruth, do you want to talk? About it? No, actually, I'd like you to do this one. Um, sure. Because I have not played around with this one at all. So this exposes, so this is a feature that has kind of always existed in Evergreen or well, part of this is something that has always existed in, well, maybe not always, it's existed for a while, um, which is that you can uh, have an external image server host images and then connect those to patrons account, patron accounts so that when you bring up the patron account, it shows their picture. Um, this has always been a kind of a database only thing, like you can do it through the interface. And so what this does is it adds a field in the interface to put that URL in. It doesn't change anything about the image hosting. You still need um, to have your external image server. Um, it needs to be able to serve images in HTTPS because that's what's supported in the field. And this field also um, has its own uh, permission associated with it. So even if you have general patron updating privileges, you also have to have the specific photo update user photo URL permission to do this piece of the patron edit. Um, so this is just a way to make that easier for a frontline staff member to do, or, you know, supervisor, somebody to do it without going into the database and putting it in there. And so I that, do highly recommend um, if you have the slides open um, or you copied that link, which I can copy it again, uh, you check out that documentation, which uh, shows also then um, how it gives you more information about where that photo appears mm -hmm. and um, in the uh, staff interface. This is something that's come up in Evergreen, Indiana recently, and then you might have seen something I sent out to the list about this using photos in patron accounts, which also comes into a I'm not sure patron privacy, potentially a patron privacy um, thing. So policy definitely needs to be in place for this as well, if you're gonna use it. Yeah. It's very cool functionality. Yeah, absolutely. Like the decision of whether or not to retain patron photos is, you know, there's potential local legal guidelines about that, as well as, you know, local practices. So that's the kind of thing where you would wanna be, weigh this decision carefully and, you know, make sure that if you're assigning this permission um, to, to staff that you, you know, consider that as well. Definitely some um, internal policy considerations to be mm -hmm. done with that. And just as a general note, like we have a lot of links throughout this presentation to things like the documentation and release notes, and that's all going to give you more information than we could fit on these slides um, or uh, in this presentation. I actually believe that in the official documentation, I put um, that Wikimedia yeah. link that is in our slide, it points to Hedy Lamar. So there's it a does. It's inside awesome. tech joke um, for you there. It's delightful. Right. It is delightful. She is delightful. All right. Ruth, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, <laughs> of course I do. You can now send a password reset <laughs> email to, uh, well, it's not an email. You can generate a link. I guess you'd send it via email. Um, to your patrons. This is gonna be very helpful for us. Right now we have to direct them to the OPAC. Um, we're using 3.7. We have to direct them to the OPAC to use the My Account feature to reset their password. Um, this I think is gonna be very helpful. First of all, it requires us to actually make sure that their email address is updated before we do that. And uh, then we can send us there. They could potentially be resetting their password in front of us and testing the thing if they wanted to. Um, but it's very useful, as you can see, if a patron uh, is either on the phone um, with us or also using their phone, they can be testing that in front of us. So yep. it's cool, yeah. it's simple, quality of life again. Yep. Yep, and this is just a way again to you know make it that much easier um, to help your patron do this. Yeah. Uh, before, if your patron had well and truly forgotten their password, I think the workflow is you had to like reset the password from the staff side, log in as them from the OPAC side, and then send the password reset as them from the OPAC. So this makes that so much easier. That's uh, definitely one of them, and there were so many. Um, it was either 
that, which there are security implications with that, yes. or it was sending them through another interface and requiring a lot of training that they may not be prepared for. They really just want their password reset. Um, and this now provides that easy way to do that. Does this work for staff accounts too? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Staff I accounts mean, are our user accounts. Yep. It sure does. Even, Even if, if you can't, can. that's a good question. And I don't actually know the answer to. Um, for those two, Jennifer's question refers to you're not typically able to edit your own staff account in Evergreen. Somebody with a higher permission level has to. Um, I have not tested that, but Taryn says, yes, you can. And I believe her. So we'll go with, yes, you can, you can send a password reset link, even if you can't edit. Yeah. Cause it's not really editing account. anything. Yeah. It's just forcing that reset email that would be triggered through my account. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sending that. Yeah. No. All right. What is up next? Acquisitions. Acquisitions. So, ACK Ac people and catalogers, you got a lot of love in three eight and three nine. Some some big and some little, but um, it's all big. They will start with a big one, um, which is the uh, rewrite all of the Angular ACK admin interfaces. Yes. 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 All of the admin interfaces have been rewritten. There's additional functionality in there uh, because of going to Angular the, the, from Dojo because it was a direct um, rewrite with no Angular JS intermediary into Angular. Um, I, I just can't overstate. I was not an Angular or not an acquisitions person at all prior to this. I hadn't used it in workflows in my library and um, I will count myself among the huge advocates for it now, especially knowing what is to come. Um, but the administration forms, fields, interfaces, I guess, interfaces are so easy to use now. It's basically just follow the directions, fill in the stuff, and it works. Yes, the Angular Act admin project could also be subtitled how, how Andrea and Ruth, you know, learned to Stop worrying and love acquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair, right? Yeah, no, hundred percent fair. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So this this slide describes kind of some of what that did, and I'll show you some screenshots next. Um, I do want to call attention to some of the lifestyle improvements. These are a little little small tweaks to the interface, but hopefully they'll make the lives of acquisitions librarians much easier. Um, such as having funds uh, have the year and owning library displayed behind them. Um, fund notes in alloc or fund information and allocation notes, mm -hmm. uh, styling to indicate negative amounts and currency symbols previously, regardless of your evergreen locale, which may not use dollars, it always displayed in dollars. So that's a nice little internationalization and localization thing. So it is now just, there is no currency symbol displayed. Um, a great future improvement would be to track currency symbol with, um, you know, locale, but that's not a thing yet, but at least now, if you know you use euro or whatever, it's not going to display in dollars. It's still it's a dollar. That's yeah. nice. Um, so here's uh, some of that menu consolidation. Um, so what you see here is the 3.7 ACK admin menu. And I've grouped the things together that, that were consolidated. So you used to have to go four different places to set up claims and you know three different places to set up funds and fund sources and two different places to set up exchange rates and currency mm -hmm. types. And um, they are now collapsed in the single interfaces. Um, so you can see this uh, in the funds, or no, claiming, sorry. Claiming um, now has those four tabs across the top with all the different things that you'll do to set up claims together. Um, I do know that there's an open bug about changing the order of these tabs to, right. more, to more appropriately match what the actual workflow is. Yeah. But they're all in one interface now, so at least you don't have to keep backing up and going into a new interface. And it is you know. clearly documented in the documentation what order. So again, this is basically just follow those instructions, click the right button, but you don't have to be going in and out of the um, acquisitions administration page. You are in right. the interface, so that's much easier. Yep. 
And then similarly, uh, for currencies and exchange rates, you now um, can manage the exchange rate right on the line of the currency type itself. And now these are also, it has to be said, these are not like live tracking, you know, some external source <laughs> right. of exchange rates. You set what you want your exchange rate to be by clicking that manage exchange rate button. And then that is what Evergreen will use to calculate exchange rates um, in, you know, funding and invoicing and things like that. So, but again, instead of having to do this in two different places, you can now do it in one place. And then finally funds, uh, fund administration, you now have your funds, funding sources and fund tags all together. And in my opinion, this is the most important one of the, these because you're in here the most and now it's all consolidated. Um, yeah, for sure. Oh, I, sorry, Elena missed your question. Would it be easier to do symbol from currency type rather than locale? Yes, uh, it would be, but this, I think this is one of the things we ran into when we were talking about potentially doing this was that if you use multiple currency types, like how to accurately reflect that in the different, you know, if you're using a combination of currency types, making sure you have the right symbol with the right currency type, it got a little hairier than expected, I think. And that was. Yeah. And, and Elaine, one of the things was in terms of having that conversation was that there were so many other things going on at the same time, like let's table that, remove the currency all together since it's reflected as a label um, and yeah. then revisit it later. There may be a, a, an easy-ish uh, fix for that, but let's get the bulk of the functionality in place and then um, address that as a cleanup. Yeah, sometimes these kinds of big projects you end up having to say like, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the other thing I wanna point out with this particular interface is that it loads uh, filtered to the current fiscal year by default. And that's when you look at this year column here and the filter is highlighted in blue. It's because it's telling you that it's applying a filter to that grid and it's filtering to the current um, fiscal year. So that's, it'll sh only show you the current funds and that's also. Which is a nice cue if you are running some, uh, expecting to see something that's not there that you can either remove that filter or change the filter um, rather than wondering well, yep. where are my 2021s. Oh, well. Yep. And then remove filter, there's a button in the upper uh, left there that will clear all the filters or you can click on the filter itself to edit it. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a feature in a lot of new angular grids. This filtering um, is something that you'll see in various places. There are a couple other acquisitions goodies as well that went along with this. Um, funding sources now have an active flag. And what this means in a practical sense is that you cannot apply new credits to an inactive funding sources, inactive funding source, and only active ones will show in your allocations list. So that way you don't have to worry about remembering, you know, what is active and what isn't. It's just a single flag and it does those things. And then, um, there is an auditor table and uh, Jennifer and Tiffany actually in their really excellent in-depth act presentation yesterday talked about auditor tables. Um, there is now in stock an auditor table for the act fund debit, which tracks changes to the debit table and makes it easier for you to troubleshoot um, and look, you know, trace back if, if changes have been made there and potentially, you know, we do love them. an auditor table. Yeah. We do love an auditor yeah. table. That should be another another T-shirt. Yes, definitely. We do love an auditor table. It's right up there with I'm not a cataloger, but I know enough Mark to be fun at parties. I, think I thought about wearing it. It's on the back of my shirt. Anyway. <laughs> Next. Next. Sorry. Bibliographic record notes. Yeah, do it. Yes. Can I just say this is amazing. <laughs> We have gone round and round in Evergreen, Indiana. Where do you uh, put a note for other catalogers because we have a shared bibliographic database to say, hey, I did this thing. If you're gonna change it, you might wanna think about it. Let's have a conversation. This is not an actual note that's been created, but those are the conversations that went around. And so now this is something that's not going to go into the mark, but it is going to be associated with the bibliographic record. It's a tab right there in the, uh, staff catalog interface and super exciting. Um, in terms of it being public, I, I'm not 100% sure what that flag does. I did test it. Do you know better than me? I have not tested it. Okay. Um, oh, it does so nothing. It does okay. nothing right now. Cool. 
is there a, a um, hope, hope, I'm not going to say hope, is there perhaps a thought that maybe that would show up in the OPAC at some point down where the, the mark record is exposed? Yeah, or, that might have been oh, the idea about oh, doing it. It's a legacy part of go. the database. And then, Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's actually a fun little detail about this is that this is another one of those things that has existed in the database like forever, there no but interface. there was there was no interface for it. So <laughs> yeah, now there's an interface for it. This is um, a, such an amazing quality of life thing. I can't even tell you. Yeah. Yeah. No. This is a uh, this is a tight one of those things that seems like a tiny improvement, but I really oh, think no. that this is going to make cataloger's lives better. We all know and, if you make catalogers happy in any way, everybody's life improves that much. Okay. And according according to, to Mike Rylander, who would definitely know, um, this has <laughs> actually been a database feature since prior to 1.0. So y'all in the deep, deep, deep time. So fun long, fact, long it could be in the database, but it might not be an interface. Right. All right. Ready? So yeah. Oh, wait, there's some, uh, there's another question yeah. about, um, mm -hmm. it would need a visible flag on the record or I'll never look. Okay. That's a great oh. wish list bug. Um, yeah. So, you know, file a wish list bug for that. And then Benjamin Murphy. Oh, that's I don't know. So Ben question. asks any idea what happens to these notes when bibs are merged? Um, Rogan, do you, do, can you speak, do you know what happens when bibs are merged? Um, does it just sort of add, could take all of the notes and put them all together on the merged record. All right, Rogan's going to check on that. Look, we're answering your questions live. Yeah, Cheers. and Robert, too, I would also say one of the things that I was hoping that would be here that isn't is that there would be a counter on that tab that um, said if there are one, two, or three, or whatever, however many notes um, applied yeah. to the record. But I, don't, I did not check to see if there was already a launch pad ticket for that. And if there isn't, I will um, actually create one. I'm entirely not entirely certain that this is something yeah w that we would necessarily want the public to be able to see yeah for sure yeah this is more for communication between catalogers i think or other staff people yeah and that um and currently all of the notes are not publicly none of the notes are bib record notes are publicly visible right now um, but in the future um the idea is that that public flag would control that so if you guys wanted to just not ever do that you know you can make sure you don't select that or i guess if you could maybe even hide that <laughs> from the modal um <laughs> through, through through open source all things are possible right? things all right are happening. super exciting um all right so okay. we've got like at least three people on that merge question so let's move move along uh um, okay. thank you Next to those looking into that is the cover image uploader which um I'm going to say was uh, first contracted by Evergreen Indiana and tested. We are actually using it now in 3.7, but it went to the community in 3.9 and we absolutely love it. And because what it does is it allows you for those records that don't have cover art to upload images so that they show up, you know, in your catalog. So if you're using carousels, your carousels look nice and people have a graphic representation of what they are looking for. There are several, um, several, there are a few library, there's some permissions and some library setting that have to do with configuring this, but it's super easy to use and the documentation is really solid. So the only why, thing- Why thank you. <laughs> yeah, and you wrote the documentation. Uh, the only one thing that I will say, if you have not been using this yet, is you may need to instruct your um, people who have the permission to do this on how to do a hard refresh if they are replacing existing images. Yeah. So if there's not an image already, usually you're fine. But if there is an existing image in there, they're going to have to do a hard refresh on their browser for them to see it. Other people accessing the catalog will see the new thing, but we've had yeah. lots of panicked um, emails about that saying, I did this and it didn't work. And I know I have the permission. I'm like, oh, but wait, it worked. Yeah, it so. did. 
And that's a good reminder that modern browsers tend to be very, very sticky with their cache. And that's why that can take a while to update. It's it's holding on to that image. It's your browser, local storage, holding on to that image for longer than it needs to. Yeah, um, and Chrome is real aggressive with that. Chrome is super aggressive about that. You can also, if you're not sure, just go look in a different browser, like pop up with yeah. Firefox, look at that record, and you'll be like, and you'll see, you know, your update yeah. there. Um, it looks like to go back to the notes, Rogan said notes are not currently merged. Um, so that is another good catalog or feedback question and potential launchpad wish list item. And actually, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Look, Jennifer Weston read my mind. <laughs> I was gonna say, hey Jennifer, can that can that go in the yeah, catalog yeah. interest group meeting? So if you have an opinion about that uh, record note question, go to see Jennifer at the cataloging interest group meeting. And let's be real. Again, I'll say, and this is not disparaging because I love it about catalogers. Catalogers have opinions. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> that's and that's. Show. And that's why we want to know what those opinions are. Yes. So for sure. All right. Uh, moving on. Moving on. Oh, yeah. this is another one of those like supposedly small, but uh, like I so love it. Love it. Love I'm it. absolutely in love with this. Yeah. And I, that's exactly how I'm going to phrase it. I am in love with this feature. Uh, yeah. This is one of those things. In it, and on the screen, you will see that. Um, we're used to the manage columns interface. Well, you may be used to it. I'm used to it. Uh, that opens it up. There is a new feature in the Angular grid actions menu uh, mm -hmm. that opens up. If you click on manage uh, actions menu, it opens up those actions that are listed in the actions menu. This is not necessarily a big deal in some of our actions menu. And I did a screenshot of one that's, you know, not particularly uh, terrible. This is from the um, holding or the holds view in the staff catalog. So you have some actions and you can get through it. But in the next one, if you can go to the next slide. This is why we need this. this. Is why. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, is in the holdings view. Yeah. So there's a million actions here. And if you don't use some of them, half of them, you yes. can now uncheck them and they will no longer be visible in your in, in your login. And this is, um, I believe, persisted as a workstation setting. So this is just, you won't mess right. up anybody else. This Again, is just it's, a, it's a grid thing. So for you. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you don't use, you know, booking, you can uncheck those booking items. If you don't use alerts, you know, you can uncheck the alert items. So this makes this menu, this actions menu so much more user friendly. It's like another one of those things that seems little, but it's an amazing quality. Of life. This will be something that we are incorporating into our training as well um, for this and also for the item status screen, which has like everything on the buffet. And but there are generally for most people, there are specific things that they go to and some things that they never, ever touch. And it moves things out of the way that you never want to touch. I cannot tell you and this was you can see i removed from here everything that is under that add subsection because yeah. i personally never use anything from there if i'm adding holdings i'm pressing the add holdings button otherwise i'm editing and so i got rid of all of that because i click on it all the time and then wonder what the heck i've done and yeah. then i'm like oh i hit the add button so this for me is a quality of life, but it will be also something that we can help our end users say, configure this a little bit more for how you work to make it easier so you don't find yourself down a rabbit hole and you don't know what happened. The software didn't break, you didn't necessarily do anything wrong, you just maybe like your mouse slipped as you were clicking. So. so Ryan asked, is there a way to set global defaults with this? I do not think there is currently a way to do no. that. This is, again, this is a workstation setting. So this is just for your specific workstation. But I can see definitely the value of you bet of an evergreen institution wanting to say, okay, well, we don't ever need our catalogers to see booking. So let's just disable that for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I do not think that is possible right now, but it is certainly possible with development. Oh, and Bill. <laughs> and Bill, Bill and Mike in unison <laughs> have informed us that those workstation settings are stored on the server, so you could propagate that to, to other users. All right, we need to move on because we actually still have like a bunch of stuff. Yeah, so believe, it, stuff. believe it or not, you guys, like we still have a ton of things. It's been okay. awesome so far, but there's more to get through. Go for it. 
Okay. Word. You want to do this one? I love this too, but you can you can do no, it. No, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. So the Angular Holdings editor, I again, this is messing with catalogers, um, and so I'm always a little bit reticent about saying this is fantastic because I know somebody's going to think that it is absolutely terrible. But one of the really great things about this is it splits apart the um, holdings aspect from the item attributes aspect of the holdings editor. So it makes um, your screen space used more economically. And then it also um, allows you to do a few more things. And I do have it open there. Um, so that batch actions um, thing, I think that that may exist. I've never, it does exist, but it's a little bit more highlighted there. You can also hide that if you never use those batch actions. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go on to the next slide, I skipped. There are now three tabs in this interface. There's the holdings item attributes and the preferences. I skipped the middle one, which is the item attributes. We'll get there. But the new preferences tab, which is in the um, current version, if you're using anything younger or older than 3.8, it allows you to display or um, hide from view uh, your um, item attributes down there. There are also um, some, and this is too small for me to see. I need to see on a bigger screen. I have it right here. Um, you can also, and this was the thing that I, I don't know, it's the little things that make me very excited about here. Um, you can, for the uh, check digits and the item number, if those are things you never use in your library, you can now disable those from um, being displayed. You can hide them. Yep. But then there's also the option down here in the item attribute settings to change the SERP lib when the owning library changes. And this is something that we came across with um, uh, our latest library that is a multi-branch system that has centralized cataloging and it allows them to be much more nimble on their uh, proverbial cataloger feet as they are moving things to branches. Um, if then in the next slide, you can see, I did have that actually um, marked in there. Of course, you can't see the action that I did to do this. These started out um, essentially the same circulation library. If you click into this box, it opens up the, the option to um, select um, your circulating library or your owning library. Um, and then it changes the other box in accordance if you have that setting um, selected, which yep. was pretty cool to me. It, um, the thing that I like best about this is that the uh, preferences are a lot less buggy in this interface. So if you if you click on it in the preferences tab, that means it will be hidden from view. It's also very easy to go in and change that if you need to um, display something. Maybe yeah. you made it too efficient. <laughs> You can also unify um, the editor if you like, which will put holdings and item attributes in one um, in one view. So that'll oh, collapse those three tabs to two tabs. Yeah, and I will note that um, Mary pointed out uh, there are a few uh, launchpad bugs on the holdings editor for item tags, alerts, and notes. So mm -hmm. if you use those features, definitely check out those bugs and see if that's going to impact how you use the holdings editor. So. There's what? a question about what about setting copy location? You mean shelving location? Yeah, the say or owning location. And they differ between branches. I don't know. I have in my mind many different locations so yeah there's a couple of different yeah ways that that could be interpreted about mm -hmm. 
Um, one of the things that I will say is- Oh, oh, oh is, thank you. Oh, there you go. I yeah, so say, that yeah. is what, what those that preference that Ruth was talking about, where if you update change strict lib to owning lib, I believe that is what. Um, yes. And, and the, the and other that's, thing about that is there are times when it's very good to have that checked, and there are times when it's not. Yeah. Yeah, so you can change that. And again, that's also a workstation settings. You're not changing that like globally for all of your people. Right. Unless you try to. All right. I know we could probably talk about the Angular Holdings Editor for literally the rest of our time, but we only have 15 minutes left and a couple of excellent features to still yep. still get through here. So these are uh, miscellaneous, not because they're any less important, but just because they didn't neatly fit into like either that circulation or cataloging act boxes that we put in. So um, first up with those are um, localized notices, which also came with an angularization of the action trigger interface. So this is available in 3.9. And what this does um, is it lets you, if you have uh, multilingual notice sets, you can now, there's a tab on the uh, action trigger events that will let you create an alternate template. So you have your primary, you know, if your primary locale is, you know, US English, um, that is going to be the primary default notice it sends out. But if you have uh, a translation of that notice that you want to add for U.S. Spanish, you can put that in. And if your patron or a staff member assigns a patron to that locale, they will get that alternate notice. So it's just a nice way to be able to send out notices in multiple languages if you need to. It does not auto translate for you. I want to be clear about that. You have to create the alternate notice template yourself and assign it to a locale. And uh, valid locales are defined there. Um, I, oh, I actually listed the table name. Good job, Pastor Andrea. Uh, they're <laughs> defined in the <laughs> I18N locale table. Um, so that is what will give you the list that you can select either from the staff interface or from the patron um, my account interface. And currently, these alternate templates are available to the notices that use the send SMS, send email, and process template reactors. So they're not available to every single um, reactor, but they're available to the three that were the most common for sending those kinds of notices. And as part of this work, um, it also rewrote the notifications and action triggers interface in Angular, which I will and show it's you cool. on the next screen. Show it. And it's cool. Um, <laughs> it is cool. Wait, no, this is the notices first. This is the notices first. So it's the next slide that's got the Angular AT interface. So this is what the... Um, the new tab where the new tab is um, on an event definition. So you would click edit alternate template. Um, you can set whether that template is enabled, what its locale is associated with, and there's a big box where you can put in your templated uh, notice text. And then um, this is patrons can actually choose this uh, option if in the um, my account preferences, and that's showing it in the OPAC, the screenshot is, but staff can also change that in uh, patron edit on behalf of the patron and say, oh, yes, we can now send you notices in French. Would you like to receive notices in French? And again, if a template is not available in the selected locale, it won't fail. It will just send fall back to whatever the default notice is. So whether that's English or whatever, it will fall back to that default notice template. So um, and this is there is the angularized action trigger interface. Um, so this is, you can see, um, it is your standard Angular grid and it's uh, gonna load a lot faster than the ancient Dojo version. It's gonna be a lot easier to use. Um, and we are excited to have this uh, available. Can you hide locales you don't use from the OPAC without deleting them from the table? You know, that is a good question. I am not certain about the details of that table and whether you can do that or not. So Rogan, or um, if somebody knows the answer to Jennifer's question about, um, is that, do you have to have um, all like locales listed on that table visible or if there's a visibility find to control those? Um, I do not know. So while uh, we are cogitating on that, I'm gonna move on to simple reports. So- Yeah, and um, this is you because because, because I am in love with this. Because you're in love with it. That's exactly why. Yeah. So this, um, I have a long 
and tragic history with the Evergreen Reporter. I shouldn't say tragic, but I have been literally using the Evergreen Reporter since 2008 through many iterations. And I have a lot of uh, painfully learned experience <laughs> with how to make it work and sometimes not work. And sometimes it still doesn't work. And I'm just like, oh my God, what do we And I have um, also fallen victim to the lazy way of doing reports where I'm just like, you know what, just give me the whole thing and dump it into Excel and I will fix this <laughs> so you know, in Excel and maybe like a little bit of open refine or something like that. <laughs> so simple reports is not intended to replace uh, the main reporter because it is purposely constrained. There is uh, limited things that you can do in this interface compared to the main reports interface. What it is intended to do is make a basic reports creation for a small set of, of reports um, easier for an average end user so that they don't have to cry about their waiting report like, you know, me. Uh, but the simple reports um, gives you, this is like a screenshot of kind of the main interface, which is the reports and outputs. It does sort of collapse that template uh, report concept that the main reporter has. So it's just really reports and outputs. Um, there is a little bit of a wizard that sort of walks you through the report creation. There are five, currently five basic report types. Um, made an effort to uh, include friendlier labels and language to like not let people to help guide people a little bit more in like their filter choices. So you're not like guessing what does this actually mean to a normal person. Um, it also adds a sort order element within the reports itself. So you can specify sort of various columns before you run the report um, as opposed to just sort of ordering your columns correctly. Uh, and all of this is, you can also, if you're an administrator, I suggest you read the release notes and documentation because there are a bunch of ways that I'm not gonna explain right now that you can go tinker with this back in the IDL and make uh, add fields or report types or things for your specific Evergreen installation. So if you're an adventurous Evergreen administrator, you can make this very custom um, for you. Now I saw that there's a lot of things going by in the chat. Were there any, Ruth, did you catch any questions? No, question? everything's good. Okay, okay. Cool, cool. This conversation about the love for Excel. Sure, sure. Yeah, I love Excel. We, we do, do love Excel. Do you have a choice of simple and regular interface? Um, they're both available. Yeah, they are both available. They're both available under the administration drop down. Um, and you can, you know, yep. use either. So this is some screenshots of what it looks like within the interface, um, the field selector, um, the filters. So like one of my favorites is actually this uh, owning library filter and the way you can add, um, sort of add and remove the branches that you want very easily. Um, there are some cases when you're constructing filters in the regular reporter where you have to like know the org unit ID. And uh, yes. I mean, sadly, I actually do have a bunch of org unit IDs memorized for Concerto, but that just says a lot about my hobbies. Um, but for this, like you can just do that based on their familiar short name. And, and then they definitely improve the life of um, people in libraries who do have reports permission. Yeah. And this is designed again for like, if you still need complex reports, this is not the venue for that. Um, that's the complicated reporter, which, you know, we joked about rebranding, uh, <laughs> but didn't. So that's, um, there's still, time. You know, there's still pl a place for the full reporter if you need complex reports or things like that. But this makes it, you know, if your CERC manager just needs to run like a basic waiting report, they can do that. You also have the same, um, I didn't show it in my screenshots, but under output options, you have the same options that you have now about scheduling that report, uh, making it recurring and emailing it to yourself. So you can set it up to run on a schedule and email if you want like a monthly waiting report or something like that. So that is all still possible with simple reports. Um, Yes, Angie, you'll never have to explain her just again. Um, so, all right. Um, next up, in terms of another thing that you can do uh, for customization is uh, a new staff portal page. This is available only to the Angular version of this page, um, it has to be said. And there is a new admin interface that lets you put custom content on this staff portal page, which you could always customize this page, but not via, again, I think maybe the theme that we missed about this, Ruth, was the, you know, things that existed are now in the interface. Like that's sort yeah. of a, there's kind of a meta, interface there's for... no interface for this. Um, but there's a few things as well, which as opposed to having it be global, which is what it used to be, you can configure this for different org units. So if you want like, you know, your local 
branch to have branch specific stuff on that. You can do that here. Um, it includes a bunch of stock elements um, and you can use either evergreen stock images or external images. And on the next page, I will show you my incredibly professional rendering of a kitten's menu. This is what I actually put on the actual test server when we tested this with our partners. <laughs> so the uh, homepage column, this shows from top to bottom, it shows an internal evergreen link, which is going to the checkout interface, but I gave it a custom external image and text for that link. But if you click it, it just opens the regular checkout interface. Um, the external URL is um, taking you to an outside uh, URL, but using a stock evergreen image. So that's one of the images that exists on evergreen. Um, then there's an external URL with um, a menu label. The label is that search for kittens. Um, label and then just a plain text entry is is the bottom one so and this would be particularly nice for um multi-type consortia and things like that where maybe you have schools that are doing this and they don't need to do all of the things that maybe the public libraries are doing in similar ways the there may be um academic libraries that want to highlight different things on their yeah. um, splash page, but they can all be in the same consortium, but have differentiated splash page here, so. Yep, yep, and then there's, like I said, there's a new admin interface to do this to make it much easier to, to implement this if you want to. And there is, of course, like separate permission and stuff, like you can't just, <laughs> this isn't available to just any staff user to go like wreak havoc, <laughs> don't worry. Ah. All right. Um, I'm glad everyone loves the, the fact that I made that all about kittens in case you didn't guess. Um, yes, in fact, Gail and Charlton did do the development for this project, which is part of why I did that menu <laughs> in the way that I did. So next up, fewer kittens, still cool. Um, as of version 3.9, um, Evergreen has the ability to act as an OAI PMH data provider which means it can send uh, structured data or the data harvesters can retrieve structured evergreen data, metadata via the OAI2 protocol. So this is great if you have group repositories, um, certain discovery layers can uh, take advantage of this new data form. Um, Mark Edit can also uh, ingest OAI PMH structured um, metadata. So that is just, um, again, behind the scenes, fewer kittens um definitely very cool particularly again if you're looking at discovery layers which is the impetus behind that work was actually to help make evergreen metadata more visible to discovery layers like you know in this case we, the impetus was to make it work for viewfind and then i think this is the last actual feature oh my god we have three minutes left i know perfect <laughs> and again a quality of life thing so this first of all made it prettier um, so it, uh, currently, currently, not currently in our iteration of carousels, it takes up about 40%. Well, it takes up 40% of the screen width, which is cool. Carousels are cool, but man, 80% is prettier. So, uh, th that has been an improvement, but then the thing that libraries have really been asking about is the ability to embed carousels on exterior websites. And so this has done some work on the back end that allows then the carousels to be embedded using an iframe, um, basically wherever you want. Yep. 3.9 and beyond. So when we get there, Anita Brown, uh, then we will talk about how simple it is to put this on your library website. Um, and it, it would then, these carousels that are still managed through the ILS then are going to be either automatically updated if they are automatic carousels or can be managed through the ILS to update your website to a certain degree. Yep. So, yep. Or they can be manual like staff if you want to create yep. a staff managed one. It just takes the regular carousel and makes it easier to, to put it other, other places like your website. Oh, Jason, I also intended to move the next previous buttons up in line with the title to make them fit even better. Okay. Yes. Something. Future improvements still coming. And thank you, Benjamin, for saying this is always one of the most exciting sessions of the conference each oh, year. Yeah. Ruth and I legitimately always have a great time 
uh, doing this. That's why we call it the Ruth and Andrea show, because it's just so exciting to talk about everything that this community has done, which is a great transition to the credits. Okay. So yes. the next slide, you're going to see the logos of every single sponsoring organization of all the features that we just talked about in the preceding, I don't know, 40 slides or whatever. So, and it's, I love this because this really shows what a community effort this is. So mm -hmm. these 13 organizations uh, sponsored all of the features that we just talked about in the preceding slides. So you can really see what an amazing community effort this has been and um, tested them when they came out. So all of the people within yeah. these organizations doing work outside of the scope, sometimes of their actual job to make yep. sure that things work, providing feedback, going back, testing the, 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 the bug fixes and things like that. So, wow. So a huge thank you to every single one of these organizations um, for actively making Evergreen better with your financial support, with your feature sponsorship, and with your contributions to the community. This, these are the groups that made uh, made this happen, along with these individuals. And this represents the developers who did all of the work that we just talked about. Now, these are not the only people who worked on 3.8 and 3.9, but the features that we talked about today, these um, are as best I could ascertain the developers that did them. And if I left somebody off, I'm sincerely sorry, please tell me and I will correct the slide. And those 11 developers represent six community organizations. And you'll probably notice that there's a lot of overlap between these organizations and the previous slide. So this is- um, You're talking so fast. Really, really amazing uh, way to show what a broad and diverse community we have of people who have made this better. And so thank you to every single one of these individuals for your brains and your code who have uh, improved Evergreen over the last year. And I think we should also thank uh, the documentation interest group, you as part of that um, for not, I mean, you can develop all you want, but unless there are instructions to go along with it, it, it becomes a thing. So thank you to everybody that has participated in that. There's a question here. Are there any plans for future development to allow staff to search for item holdings within the catalog? Deborah, I hope that you uh, come to the cataloging interest group this, this afternoon. That would be a great time to talk about that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about if there's any uh, active plans, but I know it has definitely been something that has come up in other conversations yeah. um, as a way to do that. So uh, definitely something to talk about with, with the catalogers. Um, as promised, here is our links slide with additional uh, information. So all the things we talked about, documentation, release notes, um, the bugs that went into 3.8 and 3.9 beta, um, the tabular release notes, with, which is a labor of love on behalf of Jennifer Weston to do a comparative version of release notes so you can see what went where. And um, I'm really glad that there is no session immediately following this because we're definitely uh, running overhead. So that means it's time for uh, my bad joke of the year, no. which is the truth about testing. And this is my way of thanking everybody who not only helped us test all these new features, um, but everyone who is understanding of the fact that testing cannot uncover every possible real world permutation of workflows. So this is just a reminder that, you know, we test and we document and sometimes things still happen in, in an open source community. The best way uh, to help fix that is to say to somebody, don't keep, don't, keep quiet about it say hey excuse wow, me man. this this bar burst into flames and i'm going to file a launch pad bug about that so that thank you all terrible so much awesome joke <laughs> yes I, I know terrible so good terrible so thank you all so much uh for your attention and for staying a few minutes over um thank you ruth this is always Thanks, Andrea. like it's so much fun. fun uh to do and you know we have will uh yeah we'll see you have a great day. We can stick around for a couple more minutes yeah. after there is, uh, I think the next session is at 1230. So. Yeah. And I will tell you, if you have questions, ask Andrea. She knows more than I do. That's right. <laughs> I just laid it right out there. With no Thanks. Problem. Yeah. No, that's, 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 <laughs> A, that's a lie. I just have, I just have a lot of developers that I can like side channel <gasps> nag about this. <laughs> Jason Boyer, far too Jay warm, one star. Jason Boyer is definitely one of the ones that I can nag side channel about about questions. That's true. If you if you have questions in Evergreen, Indiana, I'm just go ahead and say that's you got to call Ruth first and then me. Send me an email. Don't call me. I'm at home today. I did, however, take down my pants that I need to mend and the dress <laughs> I need to mend. 
Um, so that see, was my thing. Yeah, yeah. Seasoned yeah. professionals. Seasoned professionals. Yep. Miss my repeating my question. Any way to trim? Uh, Jeremy, um, not in that code. You would actually need to update the title in the carousel interface. Because that's where it's pulling that title from. Um, and I don't remember specifically the field I'd have to get in there, but yeah, that's where you would update it. Is the carousel label, I think that it is. But that is another good uh, wish list bug to trim titles mm -hmm. to X characters or whatever. That would be a decent oh, wish list bug. I'm sorry. You're right. Yes, Taryn, you got it. The title, I think that that's been brought up. Um, and there is a way but it um, may be database base level that has to do it or oh yeah not database um wait let's look at the documentation let's look at the documentation all right i don't think that it's in there this was something that came out there's a, there is a definitely a, a launch pad bug about it Yes, but, but it is it is not though via the interface as Taryn says. Yeah. Okay. No, I was looking for one of the carousel um, template toolkit macro, but I don't think that it's in there either. Some title doubles definitely need attention. I don't think. All right. Will column lists be alphabetized? <laughs> So there are legitimately two schools of thought about alphabetizing column lists. I, I agree with you that it would be handy to have those alphabetized, um, but I am not aware that that is forthcoming immediately. So, yes. Is there, if there's a bug, if there isn't a bug for it, you should create one. I have to imagine there's a bug, but there's I would problem. search, yeah. With the image uploader, if you load an image and then later load a new image, it just overwrites it. Yeah, that's correct. But that's a, that's an instance when you need to be sure to, at least for the person, if they want to see it, be sure to do a hard reload on their browser because that is definitely going to cache that original image. Yeah. But it and, is totally going to overwrite the old one. In the, and in I, it was on the slide, but I, I didn't call it. We didn't call it out. Um, it also, if you have a third-party image service like Syndetix or something like that, or even just the stock open library that Evergreen uses, um, a image added to the record using cover image uploader will override um, yep. the image from the service. So that's, you know, if you have um, a service that will never correct that image, no matter how many times you've asked them to, you can just go ahead and put your own <laughs> image on that record. I delivered it to your house on Christmas with a bow. Nah, we're, we're good. I, like the I often fell down the open, when I went back in my catalog days, I would frequently fall down that open library hole of going in and fixing images when I noticed they weren't working in my catalog. It is kind of great sudden, fun. And I'm like, oh my God, where did the afternoon go? <laughs> yeah. There was wish list talk. I like my new book about multiple images. There is a wish list, not on that specific bug, but there I think there's there's another bug to potentially, or maybe it was in the comments, I don't know, about like a Amazon type deal with multiple images per rec per record. There we haven't really heard anything since this rolled out yeah that's not currently possible but you know again yeah. it's open source through development all things are possible oh oh blake that's actually a workable kind of idea a mini carousel can you imagine though how many mini carousels there would be i mean look everyone loves yeah. carousels right i do like carousel. carousel right Okay. Thanks, everybody. Are we done? I think we're, we're here. Done. Yeah. Well, visit the exhibitors, um, you know, and yeah. enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks to our sponsors. Bye.